All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. Together with my guests on this podcast, I go on a journey to discover how our current financial system works, why it's flawed and why Bitcoin is the most relevant technology that you should understand. In this episode, adopt. I'm joined by Des B. He's an electrical engineer by trade who spends his time thinking at the intersection of Bitcoin and his expertise on energy and energy grids. He's also the co-founder of Looking Glass Education, one of the best educational hubs for all things Bitcoin and finance. And he's the co-author of the book, B is for bitcoin the essential guide to all things bitcoin welcome des awesome to meet online after we met briefly in uh in madeira so uh fun to uh, to talk to you again absolute pleasure to be here i appreciate the uh the invitation to come and have a chat this morning well it's your morning we just talked about it it's uh, 5 5 a.m in australia it's 9 p.m in europe but uh we're making it work so uh i'm, I'm happy you're here uh yeah i wanted to start actually you're an electrician and later Correct. on an elect electric engineer right Correct. by trade yeah yep how how does a hard-working blue-collar worker end up studying and adopting bitcoin like how <laughs> how did that go that's a great great question actually uh so in australia we're pretty lucky in terms of tradespeople generally earn a pretty good wage um so that meant eventually after many years of you, you kind of, as a tradesperson, you do an apprenticeship and you get paid next to nothing. And then, and then after you you become a <laughs> tradesperson, your your wage starts to increase. So you go from absolute bread lines into, um, you know, a, 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 a humble level of abundance. So it put me in a position to be able to have some disposable income and came to a, a bit of a fork in the road with my formal studies and everything around how I was going to direct my time and so at that stage of the game, um, I'd done some formal um, education in electrical engineering and was then at a, at a, at a point, at a juncture where I was like, I, I, was, I was putting 20 hours a week into studying electrical engineering and I had a pathway to keep studying and or make a choice. I was earning quite a good wage and I thought, well, I've never, I've always been interested in investing, but I know absolutely nothing about investing. So I didn't know what a dividend was. I didn't know what a bond was. I didn't know what any of these things were. So I, th I thought I will funnel all of that energy into studying investing. And so I very much stumbled across Bitcoin from an investing lens after having done over 18 months worth of study into investing. I read as many books as I could, watched all the YouTube videos um, and quickly found out that there was actually nothing of fair value to buy. Everything was was trading at multiples of what would be deemed fair value by any sort of metric. Mm -hmm. And then that was sort of the impetus for me to start looking under the hood a little bit more and then end up stumbling across discovering how money worked and and, and realizing the, the absolute Ponzi scheme of fiat currency system that we operate within. And that was really the, the sort of eye-opening moment for me. Yeah, interesting when you say fair value. Right, like, can you share a bit about that? Like, how how do you see that now, or how or what did you run into? Of course, you know, people talk about fair value. They talk about intrinsic value. They talk about utility value. Like, how how did you learn about that? Yeah, so that was very much, um, you know, quite often, particularly in Australia, uh, a lot of people play the stock market, um, and. None of them, to my mind, in any conversations for what humble people that I, I interact with from friends, family, and work colleagues really know how to value an equity. They're just rolling the dice. They're basically mm -hmm. saying, you know, I bought BHB Billiton today. Oh, why'd you buy it? Oh, because it went down 6% from yesterday. It's going to go back up. And that's the sort of whole thesis <laughs> around their investing thesis, right? So um, the, I was lucky in that sense that I I really wanted to understand what investing was and, and went down a value investing rabbit hole in terms of being able to um, value a stock. So what that means is looking under the hood, having a look at how much debt they've got, what sort of income have they got, what's their overheads, uh, how much profit are they making, and then doing what they call a discount cash flow analysis, which is a formula that you can um, deploy in order to give you a, a an idea of what a fair value for that company would be. And it's very akin to, you know, most people, if you said you're going to go and buy this cafe that's selling coffee on a day-to-day -day basis, it's it, yeah. intrinsically they know that they should go and ask that person, well, how many cups of coffee do you sell? How, much, how many staff do you have? What are your overheads? What's your profit margin? And you would do that for a cafe, 
it stands to reason that you should do it for BHB Billiton. It just turns out that the accounting is a lot harder. So it mm. turns a lot of people off from that respect. But the metrics are still true. It's like, what's that actual company worth? What's their assets? What are they, what's their turnover? What's their profit? What's, how's their capital allocation? All of these metrics come into play to help you determine, well, what's a fair price for that, for that company? And then what I sort of discovered through that 2018 into 2019 period was that things were trading for absolutely astro astronomical multiples of what would be normally considered fair value, which means, you know, uh, a price to earnings ratio is a nice, easy sort of metric that most people can sort of get their head around. And Warren Buffett's famously, uh, you, you know, uh, quoted as, as sort of looking at fair value of, of, of um, a price to earnings ratio around that 15 multiple, 20 if it's a really good company. And what that essentially means is, is, that, is that whatever that number is, so say it's 15, it essentially means that it's going to take me about 15 years to get back my original investment based on their earnings that they make right now. So it's a, yeah. good, it's a good metric in, in order just to thumb suck and say, oh, okay, it's going to take me about 15 years to get my money back. And what ended up happening is in 2018, 2019, you get the likes of companies like Tesla, for example, which were trading at 1,200 PE, 1,200 years to get your money back based on earnings that they'd, they'd um, made in the past. So, And that wasn't a, uh, an isolated um, example. There was a lot of examples of that where, you know, I'm looking at the universe of index for Australia, to ASX 200, the 200 stocks within Australia, the top 200. And when I used my discount cash flow analysis metrics, I had a spreadsheet that brought all the price data in, all this sort of thing. There's about three stocks that were actually deemed fair value, and they were dog shit companies. <laughs> you wouldn't want to own them. So, but everything else was, you know, absolutely astronomical. And that's really where I started saying, well, look, there's there's two things here. Either I've got something wrong, so I went back through all the math and made sure that, you know, my model was okay, and it was. Or something fundamentally is wrong with the way that this this works for valuing stocks, and and it turns out that there's nothing wrong with that method of valuing stocks. It's just that everything else in this world has attracted a monetary premium because we our money our money no longer works. Our money yeah. no longer functions as money, and I, and I can expand on that that a little bit if you like. Um, Please, when your when your savings account doesn't work like grandma used to say it worked. You know, you could put your money under the mattress and come back, save your little pennies off, and you'd come back and, and buy something uh, over a longer period of time. When when we work through this fiat monetary system where in, in interest rates are below the rate of inflation, you the longer you hold dollars, the less it buys you over time. So as humans, we may not be intuitively aware of this. It may not be consciously aware of this, but subconsciously we know that we need to protect purchasing power over time. So we look towards then other things and they attract a monetary premium. So real estate and equities are probably the two best examples because we as wage earners don't understand finance. We don't, you know, I'm an electrician. I shouldn't know how to do a discount cash flow analysis, really. When it, when it boils down to it, I should just know how to be a sparky. But I've had to in order to be able to get ahead, I've had to turn my attention towards trying to get ahead and understand and give myself an edge. And that's yeah. why I think real estate and equities in particular attract this monetary premium more than anything else. And real estate in particular, because real estate is easier to understand than equities, arguably. Like we all yeah. know people, the thesis is you need a place to live. Um, and I... I know I can go and get a mortgage. I can probably get a, another mortgage based on the equity that I have in my existing home and I can go and buy an investment property and I can let someone else pay it off for me. And, and that's really like quite celebrated, particularly in Australia. Hey there, thanks so much for listening to this episode. I just really want to ask you for a quick favor. Over the last few months, I've seen that only 75% of people who listen to this podcast or watch it on YouTube are actually subscribed. The most important thing I'm currently focusing on next to hopefully giving you interesting conversations is growing this podcast subscriber base so I can continue with it into the future. I want to thank everyone who has been viewing and listening to Bitcoin for Millennials, leaving comments here and sending me DMs. It's been super, super motivating. So thank you so much. So I really want to ask you to please hit the subscribe button on YouTube or follow me on your favorite podcasting app if you are enjoying this podcast. Thanks again for joining me on this journey. Now back to the conversation. I mean, I, lo I love this angle because 
Uh, I talked to uh, Peter Dunworth, who you might know, fellow Aussie. Uh, I think it was the second episode of this podcast. And, you know, he's a, an investment manager or, or financial advisor for high net worth individuals, et cetera. Like he's been doing this for, I don't know, 20, 30 years, something like that. And we were talking about this exact thing, right? Like you said, like as an electrician, as an electrician, I should not know about this content cash flow. And you also said like to get ahead, but it's not even to get ahead. It's to s- stay level basically, right? Because when, you know, you, and, and, I, and we talked about this a lot already on the podcast, but I still, I, I, I just love to illustrate it like this, right? Like everyone takes risk with a job or a venture, you know, whether, what, what, well, with an education even, right? To become an electrician, do I still have a job and all these things? Like everything is taking a risk, Right. And then you get rewarded in this money that is deemed trustable by your government, right? <laughs> it's backed by your government. It's not backed by anything. That's the definition of fiat, right? And then you come home from taking risk and you come home to your family who you want to be with, etc. But you are forced to take more risk, i.e., as you illustrated, you know, first spend time to study. Hopefully you study the right thing. As you also mentioned during studying, investing, you didn't even learn about what money is, right? That came after that, right? So so spending your time on whatever subject or trade or whatever, that is already taking risk to get to a certain outcome, right? And um, Peter told me that, He was like, yeah, this should be the biggest illustration because you take risk with this job or venture. You come home, you take more risk. But there's people like Peter whose job it is to figure this out as the the first thing they do, right? Not when they come home, but the first thing they do. And I I, I find that so illuminating almost, right? That, That so many people are forced to have another job that they actually don't know they should have, right? Because if you don't do this and... You also mentioned this, I think, like people subconsciously know they have to do something, right? Like your grandmother had the money under her bed, right? And then in some way it felt like she could hold on to it and it was still there after years, right? That was what savings was. But so so people know that a bit, but they don't really know that it's an actual job like people like Peter have, right? How how did you approach this? Like, do you also see this like that right now? Or like, how, how, how did that go for you? Was this voluntarily or you were really like, okay, I have to, I have some excess money. I need to do something. Yeah, well, uh, I, I pretty much was on the hamster wheel, living, living hand to mouth, paycheck to paycheck for the first sort of two decades of, of, of my existence, right? And it was only really when I hit about 30 that I started to critically assess and start to think about these things like retirement. We were starting a, a young family. Um, you know, the job that I was in no longer was serving me. So I, it was kind of the, the the point in my life where I shifted career. I I, I chose to go and get an apprenticeship. Um, you know, and when I was looking out towards my future and my retirement age, um, we've got a thing in Australia called superannuation. It's basically like our four hundred one k, our our forced savings retirement accounts projecting that out into the future and realizing I don't think I'm going to have enough to be able to retire by the time I hit that number with Mm. the trajectory as it was. So it was really this, you know, looking at, I think you you highlight a really good point. Like we as wage earners, we spend time, sweat and money, uh, time, sweat and energy. And it's really about that energy piece. Like we, we, we expend energy in order to be able to save energy to, to spend later on. Yes, and when you know the system is the total system is working against you, like you know you're, you're doing your best, you're going to work. Both mum and dad are in the workforce now, full time. You know the kids are not getting you know looked after in in most scenarios by mum and dad anymore. It's like they're going to daycares and spending all their time in school and after school care and all this sort of thing. And it's really quite an insidious thing to think about that we're spending all this time and energy. Yet we're not able to deploy that time and energy later on because we, we, we can't even save anything. There's nothing left yeah. at the end of each week. So it was really – that's where I, I stopped and I said, this this path is not sustainable, living this hand week-to-week, hand-to-hand. What can I do? 
what actions can I take in order to be able to make changes in in in, in my life? And I, I was grateful to a respect that I, I was able to look at that critically and, and assess and and realize that what we were doing in that current state wasn't going to serve us into the future. And and it was a it was a life changing realization for me. And I sort of also when I look back and I reflect on that. It was it was only obvious to me because I was living mouth to mouth, uh, hand to mouth. Like I was living paycheck to paycheck. Like if you if you're perhaps even a little bit more um, advantageous, you might not even realise it. Like mm. you might not even lift the lid off and start really tearing under the underlying uh, the the criticality about understanding the system in which we're trying to operate in. Right. Um, yeah. So you know it and it's we shouldn't be. Like this is one of why I'm so passionate. Why we started Looking Glass Education, why we wrote the book, is because I'm having these conversations with my peer group, realizing that I, you know, after two years worth of study in, into um, financial markets and macroeconomics, and realizing that nobody knows this, nobody understands this, and how do I try and distill down what was then by that point thousands of hours worth of research into just really easy to understand language. That people can take away, you know, spend a, a couple of hours and get at least enough curiosity to keep the education journey going. Because nobody is reaching out to these people from government, you know, to to let them know that our system's corrupt. Our system's yep. no longer working. It's no longer serving you. You need to take some action. Yeah, I think two two things. I like the energy analogy is really good. Right. So when you take the risk with your job or venture, you expend energy or, well, energy within certain time. Right. And the, and the time is finite. Of course, we all nobody knows how long they have, but we get rewarded with the technology. Right. The money that we use um, for which we, you know, we shake hands for, you know, a certain uh, reward amount of units for the energy we, we expend. Right. And so. Actually, the amount of money you receive is a representation of the energy that you expended, right? Uh, and also, if you are, let's say, a carpenter, that also involves the energy, you know, the cost of the wood, for example, that you use, which also costs energy to create, right? Um, and so the technology is a way to represent that amount of energy, and that is then your reward, right? Be but because that technology is corrupted, I think that's the right word, right? And it's not necessarily... I think uh, I don't know. What, I think I talked about this with Jeff Booth about the words theft and corruption, and you know, like for some people, those are like hard words to use, right? But but I think what you mean by corrupt is that the system we use is corrupted. It is well, this system is actually flawed from <laughs> from from the uh, from the get go, basically. But it's been corrupted. It doesn't work as intended or how it's told to you so when you get rewarded in the money that should represent certain amount of energy you can keep it for 10 years you know the the coins and the bills but the energy they represent has become way and way and way less and so that's why well you have that extra day job that you probably don't realize that, that you have right to figure out how can i at least keep this energy um at the same level so yeah i think that i think that's a great illustration but like how how do you think our beliefs or, well, as you mentioned, like your peer group, I have the same experience only when I started to figure this out. I also figured out that no one understands this. Like no no one looks at this, especially not in Western countries, by the way. I think there it's even more prudent, right? Because the money just works or something in, in some way, right? So there's no incentive to study. But how do you think our like flawed understanding of money actually then shapes society, as you mentioned, like both parents have to work, children go to a daycare, um, parents don't have control over, for example, what their kids get taught. Um, people have to take more risk to mitigate the energy loss. They gamble, do all these stupid things. Like what What are your thoughts there? Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of downstream effects of, of, of money. So I, I really see money as the um, communication layer between how humans communicate value. So when I go and I expend my energy in my, in, my way, in, in, in my day job and I earn this wage, that's what I'm relying on it to do is to store that energy for me to deploy later on because I've, yep. I've, I've brought forward 
I've tried to expend energy now in a concentrated eight hours a day, 10 hours a day, whatever that time period you work in order to obtain units that are supposed to maintain that energy for me to deploy later on. And when that money, and I, and I agree with you that that word corruption can be a triggering word. Um, perhaps it's better to say like co-opted or, <laughs> you know, or somewhat obscured, or, yeah. flawed, yeah. Or, a, a, exactly. So I, I don't mean there's a nefarious center of people, you know, deliberately trying to destroy the, the currency. That may very well be the case, but that's not the point I'm, I'm trying to make. But when when we destroy what is otherwise, so fiat currency takes zero energy to print. To, to, exactly. And we don't even print yeah. it anymore. Like this word printing, ab- absolutely. I think we should find another word for it because all they add is digital zeros to their ledger. Um, mon- and so money now is simply just a ledger it appears, that... appears, right? That is also, yeah. sorry to interrupt. That's also the, I saw someone say uh, or explain the word fiat in Latin is let there be. So it's yeah. let there be money, right? It appears currently yeah. right it's not even printed there's no ink there's no paper like all these things that's a fallacy right it just appears exactly. as new numbers yeah and even our modern day translation many believe fiat to just mean by decree so we we've we've yeah, determined say, that this is money. they say it's there <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? exactly yeah. exactly so it's even there's one layer of abstraction away from energy Right, so we had fiat currency. It took some what of some energy to to make the paper, put the ink on, and print it out of the printer. But even now, we've got another layer of abstraction where these units are just introduced um, at will. Yeah. So, and and all we need to think about is that, like in a really simple example, if we've got a finite world of finite goods and services, and we introduce extra currency units competing with those same goods and services, it stands to reason that prices are going to go up it's it's a bit of a you don't need to be have a degree in economics to try and understand that price is found between the equilibrium between a supply and demand of a product or service so when you introduce extra units competing with that same amount of goods and services of course it's going to result in excess prices and so can i add something to that absolutely you know yeah goods and services that if you represent that as the productivity right? It's everything we do or everything we create, right? And then again, we go back to that is expending energy or or using energy to, for example, we can say also use stored energy, right? The strength of wood or cert or sand or make cement or whatever, like, right? So everything in the productivity is a representation of energy. But that is a finite thing also, as you said, right? Because all the people together, at least the people that can work and add right not the children um that's a finite number of people finite number of hours finite number of energy um but yeah if you start valuing that in a currency right what we think is money is a currency that can be created infinitely that that's gonna create a weird situation right because the energy used to grow an apple has not changed since you know the appearance of apples and that is the entire point i think right that that why is the apple why does the apple cost more units now than 40 years ago it's not because the apple costs more energy to make it's because the units that you use to price quote unquote it in that became worth less so you need more of the units to get the same amount of energy that is captured in the apple oh 100 percent. that's a that's a really good point and and i think like just to go back to the the earlier example of, of it distorts it completely distorts us as humans and how we navigate society now. yeah like how we choose to um to expend our energy is now completely distorted because the fundamental communication layer is is no longer a, a yardstick of which represents fair value so you know this is where we see all these downstream effects now through our and this it, it touches on business it touches on politics it touches on the the family unit you know um co- co-founder of looking glass seb bunny's just got a phenomenal book out if your listeners haven't heard of it or read it um called the hidden cost of money and he digs down like he's done such a great job of digging down into this very conversation we're having right now in and around what are the downstream effects of money and what are the downstream effects of our ability to print money out of thin air? And how does it really change us fundamentally as humans? Like how has it impacted us and how we choose yeah. to navigate through society? And I think one of the most deplorable um, 
uh, outcomes of that is is this effect on the family unit. Like, you know, having mum and dad both forced into the workforce. Like, uh, I, we know, you know, and I'm not trying to say that having women in the workforce by any stretch of the imagination is a bad thing. But what it's it's really done is what I've got a lot of female friends who are Nothing, want nothing more than to stay home and raise their beautiful little kids, but they're forced into the workforce because they've got to keep up up to date. And I think that's the really empowering thing about Bitcoin in particular is, is you know, you talk to Bitcoiners who have been in the space a little while and, and most people really, the purchasing power and the store of value thing is what brings us in, but it's really the optionality for you as a human, optionality for you as a family and what that affords you over time so you can sit back when you you've been able to appreciate your purchasing power and you've been able to increase your family wealth you can step back and critically assess how it is that you expend your energy in future would you rather point it towards your children um you know and, and that might be mum it might be dad like you know it doesn't doesn't matter who that is but at least it gives you the options to be able to reassess how it is that you're expending that energy and point that towards it comes back to maslow's hierarchy of needs once you've got food shelter you know um all of the base layer of your needs your primal needs as a human in your survival you can then start to work towards this notion of self-actualization and you can only do that through purchasing power you can only do that through storing energy and being able to assess and and and, and critically look at how you want to deploy that energy in the fu- in the future and i think that's ultimately for most wage earners, I think they get that pretty quickly. Once they get that, it's like, well, hang on. You're telling me if I just save my little ass off right now, put as much energy as I can in now, bring mm-hmm. forward as much as I can to to try and, and do the hustle, and I'm able to store it in something that I come back in four years' time and I can sit back down and go, holy crap, look what I've been able to achieve. Yeah. Well, this is one of the things I wanted to ask you, like what's your favorite mental model for explaining Bitcoin? But I think this is a great one, right? Because everyone wants to do this, right? You don't want to be like, I know uh, women in this example who work so they can pay for the daycare. Interesting yep. situation, you know, like, okay, well, uh, you know, the work is perhaps for yourself, but if, you know, it's not something that you absolutely love to do, why are you doing this, right? There's no contribution to productivity in 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 that sense, right? Yeah, I think um, but, like yeah. it's a, it's a good example because I know a lot of women as well personally, and it and it might not be paying one for one, but it's definitely a large percentage of the wage. But what they're what like this whole notion of they're forced into taking swapping their whole forty hours a week into paying for daycare. Only to achieve that extra one hundred dollars at the margin, and but that hundred exactly. dollars is yeah. meaningful. But it's so meaningful that they're forced into having to swap that because they can't afford the sacrifice of that extra one yeah. or two hundred dollars at the end of that pay week. And it's a, it's it's really like most. And again, I just want to highlight the point. Like if you're a career oriented woman and and you've gone to uni and all of this stuff, and you and you want to do that, that's that's fine. But most people have been that option's been taken away from them exactly their optionality optionality is gone right and yeah. i think that's also the point um where i wanted to go is like everyone wants to figure out what is it that i want to do right what what am i here to to contribute right like what is my what is my thing and uh, you know some people know that when they're in high school, most people don't, you know, and that takes that takes some time. But in order to get there, I think you said it perfectly, you have to hustle in a sense. So you can, I always saw money like this, but eventually I, like, I always saw money like this, but it's funny, I only realized later is I always saw money as buying time, right? So yeah, you hustle, you have money so you can buy time so you can figure out what is the risk. I can take into the future, right? And maybe if I if I'm on this career path, but I want to go do something else, I need time to study or figure out what that entails, or you know what what whatever, right? And I think that's what Safe Dean also talks about about a lot that uh, people discount uh, the future and they overvalue the present, right? But the, our broken money 
enforces that even right like people don't they they don't uh, as you mentioned this you know again the woman in the example but she goes to work to pay for the daycare they have a hundred dollars extra and then what if if you're not happy and you're stuck like what 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 does that do with the quality of your life you have the hundred dollars but like are you are you happy you know but but once you get on that path you basically um yeah kind of block yourself from from figuring it out for yourself again right because then you're in that you're in that loop as you i think realized for yourself uh, as well right and i think that is the entire point that that is because how you're rewarded is something that is not working for you it's actually working against you yeah and i think it's this little self feedback mechanism it's a it's a closed loop system where if you if you've got that hundred dollars spare at the end of the week but you know putting it in the bank longer term is not going to do anything for you you're more entitled to bring forth that um instant gratification so you're going to go and buy that carton of beer just to get the buzz on the weekend so it it starts to then feed into probably less than ideal behaviors then what would serve you better as a human longer term like you know Mm. alcoholism and drug addictions and you know, sitting on your butt watching Netflix because you're just exhausted. Whatever short-term gratification. Whatever short-term gratification you can, just to give you a sense of, at least it's worth it because I can now sit down Mm. and do this, right? Whereas us, you can have any conversation with with any Bitcoiner and we're very much more long-term thinking because we've been able to secure that in in a means that we know when we look forward, there's hope. And that's used. That, I think that word hopes overused a lot. Like it's a bit of a cliche, but it really does give you then hope in the future to know that that optionality is coming. So you know, there's a path out of this hamster wheel. Like you've yeah. you've got you've got this hope in and around being able to change the outcomes for you and your family over time. You've just got to stay the course. Yeah. I think it. Uh, I, yeah, I, I love this this topic, right? Because I think we don't. We'll talk about Bitcoin, but I think this is the the problem that people need to realize that they're in, right? And I said it many times on the podcast when I was thirty and I had a mortgage and I worked at a bank. I did not realize <laughs> what I was in, right? So everyone has this, right? Like everyone has this up to, I hope a certain degree, but most people. Are, are totally una- unaware of this. And I, I think this is the entire point. The entire point, as you just mentioned, is the, the hope for the future is, can I create space in you know time um, to take ownership for myself instead of having other people that don't care about me, not in a malicious way, but more in like, they also have their own life. <laughs> you know, they don't care that, you know, you're Daz and I'm Bram and, you know, whatever they're doing their job, but there's other people that that influence your life basically. And once you realize that, then I feel that is kind of like this matrix point, right? Red blue pill kind of thing. Like, okay, so there's other people that influence my life. Is it helping me or not? And if you realize that it's not, then like you cannot really look back, right? And that is the red pill moment, I think, in a sense that that hopefully will give you the urgency to be like okay i need i need to study this in some way shape or form right and yeah i think if we then get to bitcoin bitcoin eventually gives you the opportunity to 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 create that space towards the future for yourself because it actually gives you provable certainty it's the ultimate transparent thing right anyone listening to us should not uh listen to us they should study so they can verify it for themselves right i think that's the entire point like once you take that ownership and you study then you realize that you can actually do it right you don't have to um give your responsibility away to other people that don't care about you yeah and there's this saying in the bitcoin space um odell's famous for coining it be humble stack sats right but i I think to a degree yeah one of the best onboarding mechanisms is is to a degree not to be so humble. Like, don't be shy of celebrating the optionality that's provided for you as a Bitcoiner. So as you move forward and, and you know, don't be shy about the extra optionality that's afforded you and the, and the lifestyle choices that it now affords you. 
because it's a, a great onboarding mechanism. So your friends and family are going to look at you and go, what's that guy done? How come he's able to pull his kids out of school and go around Australia for a year in a caravan? What is it about him? What, he, what has he done? I want that for me. Therefore, maybe I'll have a conversation um, about how he's able to do that. And it's quite simple. I was able to do that through Bitcoin. <laughs> you know, so I, I think to a degree, don't don't be so humble. Don't be afraid to celebrate publicly with, within your closed space um, your successes in and around what this thing's done for you because it's 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 a life-changing mechanism. And I think the more people that do that, it, it sort of reinforces this notion I'm too late because most people think, oh, I've missed that boat. Like all the gains are gone. But like we're on this precipice of, in, in, you know, institutional adoption coming. The gains aren't even, we haven't even begun to realise the potential gains that are, are possible through the purchasing, uh, appreciation and purchasing power. Because we've got a finite source of this, we know that everything else is forever increasing. So in Bitcoin terms, everything becomes cheaper over time. So there is no right time to start. The right time to start was 13 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, the next best is today. Yeah. Well, and it is because the money that you are forced to use uh, will go down over <laughs> over time, right? I think that is also pretty verifiable. I, th I think it would be nice if we build a bridge between what we just talked about and then if we go to Bitcoin, right? So you studied investing. You were like, there's nothing of fair value that I can put my money in. Eventually, you found Bitcoin. Like, what what was your aha moment where you thought, okay, this is something that I should dive into? Yeah, so the, the real, um, so I guess the pathway was from realizing that there was nothing worth a fair value and then looking at the um, formulas that I was using to be able to um, determine whether something was valued at fair value or not. And one of the important things, uh, one of the important variables that goes into that formula is um, your discounted cash flow. Uh, sorry, your your, um, uh, your discount rate, and that's normally compared to what they call the risk-free rate of return, and that is normally a U.S. Treasury bond, uh, for example, or a government bond, depending on, on wherever you're domiciled. So the, the thesis behind that is if I can lend the government money and we know that they can print it out of thin air, it's deemed to be the risk-free rate because they'll just keep printing it, right? And so that is the comparison rate by which goes into your formula to then compare everything else in the world. Like if I can lend them for money for free, what do I want in return if I'm going to go out on the risk curve? Um, and and what's that worth to me uh, in terms of you know a return? What do I expect as a return to go out and take on excess risk? So that's the fundamental thesis behind how uh, a discount cash flow model works is you're doing a comparison against this risk-free rate of return. So when I was looking at this and I realized that you know, they're inversely proportional. So the the lower that the dollar, uh, sorry, the um the interest rate goes towards zero, everything else trends toward infinity. My willingness to buy, you know, they're inversely proportional. So if one's going down towards zero, the other's heading towards infinity. So that was really the the start of me then trying to understand money. So how does interest rates work? How do interest rates get controlled? Why are they near zero? And how do they? What's the control mechanism by which they they set those interest rates because we know we wait on the Fed or your central bank of choice. Like for us in Australia, it's the Reserve Bank of Australia. They meet every month and then they dictate what the cash price is going to be. And then that then flows through everything else within the financial system. So yeah. when you realize and you understand what it takes to control interest rates, it's basically just through money printing. And then that was really where I probably landed on gold first. Hmm. And went, oh, okay, now I'm a gold bug. This this sound money thesis, scarcity, these, yeah. you know, and it was really around trying to understand, well, if this is true and we're in, we're trending towards an inflationary environment where interest rates are below the rate of inflation and we know that our purchasing power depreciates if we're not beating inflation. That's the fundamental thesis. You've yeah. got to get above inflation. Maybe and, to, to, to explain, because I, I love where you're going. The, the interest rate set by the central bank basically determine how fast or slow, um, you know, what the rate is of the devaluation of the money. Do I say that correctly? Well, yeah, how much the money costs, basically. Yes, that's, that's the, yeah. 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 What, yeah, yeah what is exactly. the cost of capital? Yeah. So what is the cost yeah, to borrow money? And then exactly. 
what's the, the inflation the really... is the rate of how how uh, fast <laughs> it gets yes. devalued yeah yes exactly yeah. and and they control it so they they're trying to control inflation and that the easiest lever for them to do that is through interest rates so if they yeah can control the money flow and the cost of capital they think they can contain yeah. this beast that's called yeah. inflation so and, higher um, rates gives a slower money flow because less people will be able to afford slash borrow right new money that then enters the system right yeah and that's... more money because more money more units entering the system will result in a, a lower valuation of each unit and that is the inflation exactly right yes yes and then so when you look at the inflation rate and when you realize that your interest rate is below the rate of inflation we now look at what what type of assets perform well throughout history in that type of environment and that's where you you land on fixed and hard assets things yeah. things that can't be printed out of thin air is basically yeah. what that means so A hard asset is something that's difficult to create correct exactly yeah. right exactly right so that's finite things scarce things so to a degree it's real estate and you can argue there's some there's some nuance in and around you know their ability to add a floor to a skyscraper for example so you know they can control you know uh, society when i say they can control there's no one obviously central planning that necessarily but like there's ability for you to inflate real estate to a degree but real estate's a really good thing for most people to understand like okay they can't necessarily create more land or it's very hard to create more land so yeah. that's that's usually an easy thing for people to understand and that's where you land on ultimately probably precious metals as well they can't be printed out of thin air things like energy they can't be printed out of thin air and then that's where i was probably turned towards understanding the monetary history around gold the gold standard and why we left the gold standard and really like looking at why gold failed so if gold was this great money how come we don't use it anymore and it's really around you know and this is where fiat currency started to proliferate was around the 70s like obviously 1971 was the day that we left the gold standard officially um but it was really around understanding probably what were the drivers behind that decision and i think one of the the, the large ones is this notion of the fact that gold's really hard to deal with when you open up like globalization started we started looking at global trade more so, you know airplanes were a lot more prolific you know, um, uh, shipping lanes, all of this stuff, the world started opening up. And when you are on a gold standard, you've either got to have an inherent amount of trust in a, in a centralized system, or you've got to physically move gold to settle trade. So if you've got two separate countries, you know, say you've got France and Japan, and they're geographically separated, how do they settle the trade balance when one operates in euro or francs back then, rather, and the other operates in, um, in, in yen? Maybe France doesn't want yen, so you're going to have to settle on gold. Now, the, that gold needs to either be directly settled, so France has got to ship it, secure it, send it, um, protect it the whole way. and then Proof if it's Jap real. <laughs> and then, yeah, if Japan gets it, like, do I trust France? No, probably mm -hmm. not, so I'm going to cast it. I'm going to probably melt it down. I'm going to recast it. And all of that is a super, super expensive um, you know, exercise and, and slow. It'll take at least six to 12 months just to do that, and then global trade probably reverses, and then Japan owes the money to France, so they've got to send it back. So that's where these centralized bodies ended up really popping up, and Bank of International Settlements is a really good example of why people don't shouldn't trust a centralized um, a centralized body with with that task, because um, World War Two is a good example. So Germany invades Czechoslovakia, and the Bank of International Settlements used to settle most of the gold trade, and Germany invades Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia's got their pile of gold in the Bank of International Settlements, and so does so does Germany, and so does all these other countries. Germany gets in contact with the Bank of International Settlements and says, hey, yo, we've just invaded Czechoslovakia. That big pile of gold with their name on it, that's now ours. And the Bank of International Settlements turns around and says, okay. So it's, it's wow, a, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, you can wow. read about that in the Terror of Babel. I think is the is the book that explains that, um, and that's a book all about the Bank of International Settlements. So it's it's just a really good, um, you know, and, and obviously there's probably a lot of more uh, that went on the back end of that, but that's essentially what what ends up happening, right? And that's why we need a trustless system because nobody trusts anybody yeah. anymore, nor should they, nor should they have to. So um, this is so understanding why gold potentially failed. Is why we ended up on a on a fiat currency because 
gold couldn't keep up with technology. We needed, you know, and as we started to digitize as well, this further exacerbated this and, and how we ended up on, on such a system that we're on now where we've got more dollars in circulation than actual physical currency notes because prior to digitization and the internet, you needed those physical notes. They needed to be printed. You, you, yeah. know, you had a degree of fractional reserve banking, but now that we're just digital, it's just a zero on a computer screen, it's a lot more easier for you to introduce a credit system based on top of that. So a fractional reserve system in its historical sense used to say you should have X percentage of dollars backing the credit that you've got out in the system and will allow you to inflate this to a certain degree. But when we've moved towards digitization and the internet and internet banking, that requirement has trended towards zero. So historically, that used to be around 10%. You needed 10% of reserves in, in your kitty. That's the physical cash yeah. in order to go and lend. Now it's about zero, depending on your But even where then, it was, even then it was forced trust, right? Like that Correct. is what people now also say. So back then it was even forced trust. After the gold-backed money was gone, it was even more forced trust, right? And I think that is also kind of what you sometimes hear as arguments for the money we have, like people who are totally oblivious, but anyway, right? But they say, yeah, but uh, it's a trust. No, you are forced to trust it, right? It's not, you never made a conscious decision to trust the money that your government says you should use. That That's the entire point, right? And that's why I think this is, and then I, I love the first part that we talked about. This is what people need to wrap their heads around. Like you are forced to trust someone who doesn't care about you. Right. Whoever is in the seat in the government or the central bank, it doesn't really matter. Like if they can do it to Czechoslovakia, right? Yeah. They can do it to you. They can do it to you. Like that's the point. Like they gave their responsibility away to a bank of international settlements that on paper said we have these agreements, blah, blah, blah. You know, all these people that were in charge put in their autograph and still, you know, their gold got stolen. Right. And I think that is the the, the entire concept that people need to wrap their head around. Like you are unwillingly giving away certain responsibility and therefore your life is influenced by people that don't know or care about you again not in a malicious way but just they don't know you like it's not you're you're not the individual that you are for yourself or your family right like i think that is the point that you need to figure out and and so you you don't own what you think you own you don't own the numbers that you see in your banking app right like your grandmother had real real you know bills <laughs> probably under her bed right like the numbers you see in your banking app they aren't even there yep you know and and and, and when we had to create the ink and the pay the ink and the paper you know right um we talked about energy before energy cannot be created it's it's transformed right yep. and so the energy you expend again you know for your job or venture is in your body but you are being rewarded with something that just appeared without expending any energy. And that is the, the dumbest exchange we could all ever uh, take part of, right? And so I, I, I love that we could talk about the technical part, but I also love to like zoom out a bit and make it a bit more conceptually for people to be like, okay, is this the mechanic that, you know, is this the thing that I'm actually participating in, right? Because for me, it clicked like that, basically. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, like, Lynn Alden talks about this in her book, Broken Money. Uh, this notion of, like, money is essentially just a ledger, and it's just taken different forms. So we've mm -hmm. used various tokens to represent this ledger. So this, this checks and balances between that energy that I expended and, and what I'm then owed, right? So we can go right back to, to, to villages, like we were all hunters. I went out and I made the kill. You know, I brought back the mammoth, and we all gorged. And we'd chalk up on the on the cave, like yeah, Daz was a good lad. He went and got one kill. Yeah, one. Uh, we let we <laughs> yeah. let Brahm eat for for free. Brahm owes us a kill, right? And so this is this this notion around this, this credit system and checks and balances between the debits and the credits, right? That's it's in its fundamental form. That's a really easy way to to sort of yeah. understand that concept. And then as we sort of evolved and we started to progress, it was then like we we naturally came to barter in like trying to swap those goods and services. And then we evolved into representing, having some sort of token representing that trade. Because I, you know, if I had chickens and you had eggs, 
Um, or maybe that's a bad example because I probably have the eggs as well, right? Yeah, you got the potatoes. <laughs> so I come to you with the chickens, and you're like, I don't want chickens this week. I want beef, right? So, you know, we needed something that represented that trade that we could then start. That was that was socially coincidence acceptable. of wants. Coincidence yeah. of wants, hundred percent. So, you know. But essentially, that's still like a ledger. We're still just parking value in something that everybody recognizes for, um, for for being this this you know balance between checks and debits. And and if we fast forward for today, the ledger still exists. The ledger is just like your bank has its own ledger, and it's saying you know Daz has X amount of units, but we've got to put an inherent amount of trust in that ledger to say that that is true, and then. That bank has its own ledger, and then the next bank that it's working with has its own ledger, and we're just relying on this system of trust between these two that the system keeps keeps going along. So when we look at why like gold was necessarily a, a good form of money is because it was directly tied to energy. We knew it took energy. It was finite. We couldn't make more of it. Alchemists have been trying for centuries to create a formula to create gold out of thin air. They have, still haven't found it. And it takes an inherent amount of energy to dig it out of the ground, and we know that it's finite. So to this is where it's also from the earth, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. We can even go back to you know. So it's the... actually stored energy, just like oil is stored energy, right? Like in the oil is one hundred percent. And so when we look at what made gold good, a good money, is because of that form of scarcity. But then we look at the digitization of the world and the need for things to move at the speed of light. So it was only sort of natural that we came up with a form of money that mimicked all of the great properties that made gold great, directly tied to energy. And I guess that's a probably good – we could start talking about that and what that exactly means. But we also have all of the benefits of what gold – made gold a good money as well as all of the benefits that, you know, digitization and the internet have provided society. And we've mashed them together to create what is essentially – the most pristine form of money with all of the features of all of the great monies in the world, as well as keeping up with today's technology that, that we've ever had. And essentially yep. all it is, is a ledger, much like the banking system is a ledger, but the difference is it's immutable. Everybody's got a copy of it. Everybody can verify the, the balances. Everybody can check that there's only X amount in circulation and that they're distributed amongst the, all of these addresses. And if you're lucky enough to have one of those addresses, everybody can check. Like and yeah. that's that's really the the, the mind blowing difference is money has always been a ledger, and and it's just been over time co opted and obscured and uh, built a, a large amount of trust and we've just taken that system and we've just made it better and we've made it yeah. completely immutable, verifiable, and everybody can participate. I got an idea to write about now. It's actually we condensed all these opaque layers into just one thing that is ultimately transparent, right? Beautiful. Like like the internet condensed all the information in the world into like one accessible network of information. Um, before we continue, I, li- I, 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 I love this, this angle again. Um, I, think, I think two things, right? When we had gold or um bills uh money how do you say it? like uh notes that represented gold um that was a one on one relationship right there was actually a certificate uh here in amsterdam it was the first actually actual central bank in the world right people brought their gold they got cert- they got tickets certificates that's what they could trade with but then eventually if you went back to the central bank you would actually get the gold right it was a one on one um basically note to to get the real the real thing but because we started obscuring that or well making it more abstract i think it's abstract because we made it more abstract more layers etc that's when it became obscure that's also when um uh, i love to say this a lot but that that's when the corruptibility opportunity came about right because if you are in you know six layers above us two right you're closer to the creation of the money and you have the opportunity to make use of that whether as a country or a big corporation or whatever you know a bank um then yeah you take advantage of the opportunity it's still survival of the of the fittest right because uh, yeah in a sense we are all corruptible right I, I, everyone would say well no i wouldn't do that if i was in that position but i I've, i think we would all do that to be honest 
But the point is, uh, I'll get to Bitcoin, but uh, the one, one other thing you mentioned about trans- transferring the gold, that final settlement part also got way more uh, opaque and, and abstracted, right? Like it's not that when I went back to the central bank in, in Amsterdam, that was um, not really final settlement, but I could get the thing, right? And if I gave you my gold coin, that was final settlement. That was the base layer of of the representation of value. I gave you the gold coin. I didn't have it anymore. You had it. That is what is called final settlement, right? And if we transact today with credit cards or, or bank transfers or whatever, that's like layer six on final settlement, right? And final settlement is only once a month between banks. And then you have between countries is once a quarter or whatever. Like this is all abstracted. But what Bitcoin brings is not only the ultimate transparency of the ledger, as you mentioned, you know the immutable, you know fiscal policy, the, the the policy, monetary policy of the of the networks or the issuance, the eventual supply, and all these things. But it's also that final settlement. If I send a Bitcoin to you, you have it. I don't, and you don't have to believe me that you have it. You can actually verify it, right? And every ten minutes, seventy five thousand nodes or whatever the amount is, right? They will all say this is still true, and. Yeah, I think to end this segment, I love to say that the Federal Reserve in America has never been audited, right? Not even, let alone every 10 minutes, right? So we have no clue what happens there, but we are still forced to trust that money. And, you know, Federal Reserve in America is a good example, but this is the same in any in any country. Wherever you are, you have a central bank that issues a currency and, you know, check out Google if they have been audited, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, but yeah, so and and this is also I think why it's hard to understand Bitcoin. It's a lot together, right? It's all these dimensions. It's the concepts of of energy, as in you know individual energy expenditure, which is captured. It's all these things. Um, like, what are the most common counter arguments, counter uh, like of or like arguments against Bitcoin that you face that? Uh, that like how do you respond to them like what what's the most common thing you hear i I guess like uh, to keep on the same similar theme it's it's this notion then around well bitcoin was created out of thin air like it it just you know some guy was coding and then he's like hey i've created this thing called bitcoin and next minute we're meant to believe that this digital representation of 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 this thing is this ultimately scarce asset so um i think that's really you know the, the the main pushback is this is this notion for people to really understand what makes bitcoin different than any other digitization and i think like largely it was by first mover advantage for for a start there's a few things that play into it like network effects and 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 all of these types of things but ultimately you know it it does benefit from this notion of first mover advantage in in terms of having the most traction having the most energy that's thrown in it, and that's all provable as well in around how much energy what people are making economic choices to point energy use and excess energy and wasted energy towards creating this thing and we can prove that and it's really only the the decentralized nature of bitcoin by having that first mover advantage like it is the only provably decentralized monetary good that we have um you know and, and this is where the arguments come in around oh what about all these other shiny crypto things you know that I, I keep seeing why is it bitcoin and ultimately all of those when you peer under the hood you will find that they've gone through some form of centralization some form of pre-mine some form of um, centralized body that's dictating the rules um they're doing other things they're not money uh and and many people have can speak to this more eloquently than I can, but what a, a, what a blockchain is really good for is money. It's in a very inefficient database, so it does one thing and it does one thing well, and that's money. Anything else, like claiming to use Bitcoin uh, blockchain for um, for these purposes, yet to be proven anything useful. Like uh, most of it's a distraction. So I would say just stay in the lane. database. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So. Um, you know, and, and that, I think this is where the energy piece for me, like being an electrician and engineer, really started to also cement the that this is the this is the big daddy. This is where I need to be directing all my time and energy because that's where economic actors are pointing their activity towards as well. And and it's really around then what Bitcoin means for humanity in terms of energy. 
because energy, we know energy is directly correlated to human flourishing. So your ability as a human to access energy provides you a better life. It keeps you, you know, uh, keeps you warm through the winter, keeps you cool through the summer, and you can experience a lot more human flourishing if you can harness and obtain energy. And that's really where looking at Bitcoin, what we've never been able to directly tie a monetary good to energy before. Uh, and I think it's Henry Ford and Tesla and all these brilliant minds throughout history have often prophesized the fact that at some point our our um, monetary units in which we communicate value to each other will be energy. It'll be and and Bitcoin is the best representation of that relationship that I've ever seen, and that's really really a fascinating thing to to think about. And the the you know where Bitcoin can. Um, can tie into energy grids, energy production, generation is really going to be a game changer for the globe. Especially like, and you can argue whether you agree with this notion behind going 100% renewable, right? Um, I get the argument. I get the, the, this idea around us having finite resources. Probably the most important thing to realize about Bitcoin's energy use, and it does use a lot of energy. Nobody's arguing that it does not. But what is probably the most important thing to realize Realize is that um, at its at its fundamental level, I you know in Australia here we've got quite high energy prices. I can't plug a Bitcoin miner into my wall socket at home. It's deemed, it's not an economically viable decision for me. It costs me more in the energy use than I would be mining the Bitcoin. So really, why that's important to understand is that by its nature, Bitcoin is incentivized to seek out the cheapest cost of energy. Now, if there's that those cheapest costs of energy always end up being wasted, otherwise unused, excess capacity, or renewables. Those those four things generally make up the energy mix that, that Bitcoin is using. So where that's really important for you as an energy user and as an, as an energy consumer is it can help capitalize and monetize energy grids so that your bills are cheaper. And this is where I think the education really, really needs to come to the fore in terms of um, why. why does it get cheaper? Sorry to interrupt, but it gets cheaper because it will make sure that all the energy that is created within the power grids will also actually be used and not wasted, right? And therefore, the power company earns more money, <laughs> right? So they yeah. don't have to charge you for the electricity that you as an individual use for your home, right? Because basically you're paying double or triple, you know, whatever the real cost of the energy is because they're also wasting a lot of energy. Yeah, that's, that's 100%. And I can explain why that is a, a little bit. And I think there's probably a thing I'd like to clarify in there um, just to make it clear in case anybody's like, you can never use 100% of your grid because that's absolutely true. But what we can use is introduce Bitcoin into the profitable region between uh, there's always going to be a profitable region of operability above your maximum demand. So I can talk about all of that. So maximum demand is basically the the maximum demand on the grid that everybody wants to consume power. And we experience that typically you get a peak through the day period, but you'll also have seasonal peaks as well, depending on where you are. So I can imagine in the Netherlands, it gets quite cold. Your maximum demand is probably going to be around winter. For us in Australia, it's typically summer because we get you know, really, really hot summers. So everybody's air conditioning loads. So a lot of power usage is either direct, most of the time directed towards heating or cooling. They're really where your, your peaks are. And what's important to understand about an energy grid is to make sure that you've got the energy available. We have to be generating energy in real time. There has to be capacity. There has to be spinning motors, yeah. solar capacity, wind capacity available to be tapped into at the moment that we need it. So what we do is we do forecasting on the historical data in and around how much energy did we use last year? What are the trends in industry? Like we've got EVs coming on, we've got air conditioners going on. We expect that this energy use is going to continue to increase. So what we have to do as a grid is we have to have enough energy to cater for the worst of days. That has to be available. Otherwise, we have reliability issues we've got rolling blackouts we've got load shedding schemes that we you know you only have to look at um, countries like south africa who you know you can't rely on energy power 24 7 there you just simply can't because they don't have enough generation capacity so the developed world very much manages that 
um, a lot better than, say, the developing world in, the, in that regard. But what's important to note is that if we are going to build out a grid that's going to cater for this worst of case scenario, the worst case, you know, it might only be one day in the whole year that we've got to cater for with this maximum demand. If your maximum demand's here, like at a peak, and then your normal demand is down here, what demand represents is your maximum billable amount that you can charge people. Right, it's your maximum revenue that you're gonna ever gonna be able to obtain from your consumers to pay for keeping the lights on to keep the yeah. all of this capacity going. So what Bitcoin mining represents is a fully controllable and flexible load that we can introduce to introduce another revenue customer into that grid, so that when we are not at peak demand but we're at like a normal demand level. What we can do is introduce a new revenue model, a new consumer to be able to help monetize the excess ca um, capital costs that we had to put in to build that grid out to cater for the worst of days. If we yeah. don't have... That's the most important point, by the way, I think. Yeah. Because you make an investment for the energy sources that you use to create the electricity, right? So, you know, what, whatever you do, hydro, uh, sun, wind, wh whatever, right? And... Just from a business standpoint, you want the highest ROI from your investment. How do you get the highest ROI is that you have these sources running <laughs> whenever they can run, basically, right? Not not only to be prepared for the highest load, or how, how did you say that, like the, the maximum day, yeah, but also just to get the highest return out of your uh, investment. And so, they will so probably run... Right, still run, but they just waste the energy, and then they just charge the 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 users of the energy that is actually used just double or triple. That's how to yeah, get the return. Yeah, exactly. And and the more that we investigate renewables, the 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 harder that is to balance because a lot of you know, and that's slowly getting fixed with technology. We don't necessarily have to dig down into into what that means, but solar is a really good example of us losing a bit of the ability to control the generation. And um, so what we have in Australia is what we call a duck curve effect on the energy grid. So through the day, what we're starting to notice is we're not at home using all our power through the day. We're at commercial you know, buildings, we're in the workplace. Mm. So our maximum demand, our load profile is actually quite low in Australia through the day. But what's starting to happen is that we've got too much. We've gone very aggressive on rooftop solar here. So just about every person in Australia has got solar on their roof to help offset their own energy costs. Well, that was the idea, right, is to is to spend a bit of money, put some solar on yeah. there and help offset your costs. But what that's resulted in is downstream making your the energy that you do pay for even more expensive. But that's another rabbit hole for another day probably. <laughs> but the really um, the, the dangerous precedent that we've set now with this idea is that we can't control this solar in, in its current form. So we've got too much generation happening through the day that we don't have enough load to soak up. And what that does is it puts pressure on what we what we refer to as the heartbeat of our network. So these rotating machines is what sets the heartbeat of the of of, of a network. So in Australia and in the in EU it's around fifty hertz. In the US it's sixty hertz. That's the representation. 50, 50 times a cycle on fifty hertz is the heartbeat of your energy grid. When you've got uncontrollable load, uh, uh, sorry, uncontrollable generation that actually puts stress on your rotating machines. Your rotating machines actually need this. They need load. They need a certain amount of load to be able to um, maintain that heartbeat. When you've got too much generation putting pressure on that, it actually speeds your heart rate up. And just like you, it's not good if your heartbeat goes too high or too low. That is critical for an energy grid. And we've only got a very finite band in order to be able to maintain a nice healthy balance. So if it's 50 mm. hertz, we've got about 52 to 48 hertz is the band that we can operate in safely before equipment starts blowing up and we, we experience some really quite negative effects on the grid. So when we've got uncontrollable solar, that's actually making that heartbeat speed up and that's a really, really dangerous precedent to set and a really dangerous, um, well, we can we can look forward into these policies around increasing renewables and we can start to understand the constraints that we're going to have, the more that we explore that. And here's another example why Bitcoin mining is the perfect solution because what ends up happening on your energy grid is that we've spent all this money building up this hydro facility here and this wind facility here and all these things. 
I mean, they're up economic actors. Like, they want to be generating 24 hours a day, seven days a week to pay for the excess, the, the cost that they expended to build yeah, this thing. Yeah. yeah. And when we've got too much of one thing, that balance gets thrown out. So what you end up with is wasted trapped energy, like hydro scheme, for example. When that sun is shining and we're up in Cairns here in far north Queensland, we've got a lot of water. So through, you know, through, through winter, we've got these weirs that are used with these hydro facilities. They're full of water. They're ready to go. All they've got to do is release the water through the hydro generator. But if there's not enough demand on the network, those hydro generators have no, no ability to generate. So the bid actually goes um, goes negative and they will actually get charged to generate. As crazy as a notion that that sounds, if they choose to start up their generator, yeah. they will be charged for generating instead of you know getting paid to generate. So that's where Bitcoin mining as an economic actor to be introduced into all of these things really starts to make sense that if I've got a really large load that I can introduce to the grid to introduce a new revenue model, then all of a sudden I can start tapping into those otherwise wasted energy sources. I can start soaking up some of that excess generation capacity like solar, and I can start to turn that into revenue so that all those downstream costs and effects don't end up going on the consumer. Because if we don't do that, consumers end up paying either one of two ways. They pay directly through their consumer bill, through their energy bill to pay for all this stuff, or they pay it indirectly through government taxation because t governments are then like want to incentivize that that building out of that capacity so they're going to introduce government subsidies which are funded by taxes great last points yeah i i think it's it's maybe good to add why then bitcoin miners right they are computers why wouldn't we use computers that do AI, right? Or, you know, whatever the other ideas are. But I think the, the point with Bitcoin is that if you have a Bitcoin mining facility um, and you can turn off computers at will, they are not servers, right? They are computers that have one task, basically. Um, that is why I think, you know, I, but please add, like, that's the biggest argument for Bitcoin mining is that let's say you have, I don't know, 10,000 miners and you need to turn off 5,000 or 8,000 or 7,000 or 6,000. That doesn't really matter. But if you have a server park that is uh, machine learning, uh, <laughs> I don't know, AI, something, uh, you know, powering something like that, then it's going to be really hard to identify, okay, which which servers are actually being used right now, right? Like, am I not cutting someone off from the servers that I provide, right? So there aren't really any other computing uh, power uh, or, or like companies or uh, constructions that use computing power in just that singular way like Bitcoin mining does. Do That's I explain right. that correctly? It's, it yeah, it comes, it comes down to this disruption, like disruptability. So if we turn off a Bitcoin mining facility, largely it doesn't affect the network as a whole because it's going to be a small portion of, of the whole exactly. and then we just yeah. keep tick-tocking. And if it was a longer-term thing, you know, the Bitcoin um, difficulty adjustment, you know, which we don't need to get into right now, but that just adjusts. So the long-term, yeah. it's only ever a short-term effect anyway, but the long-term effect, will will adjust as well if that were the case um and you and you contrast that to like you say with if it was a um a, a data server an ai server uh Whatever, netflix yeah. server amazon web services there's real life utility relying on that on that function so you know you can imagine if it was a netflix server and it went out people will be up in arms with netflix because hey my stream just got interrupted i was halfway watching the matrix right and, and i can no longer watch it so it's not as easy to use those other types of, of data centers in order to be able to switch off on, on a whim. And, and the response rate is really what makes Bitcoin mining unique. So we, this idea around, and they call it ancillary services, like using load. So we've got, we've got supply side demand, uh, supply side controls, and we've got demand side controls. So demand is about controlling load. Can we control, and we've used really large, like Iceland's a great example. They've got a lot of aluminium export because they've had a lot of excess energy. 
So aluminium smelting, uh, aluminium production is is really energy intensive. So that's where they've had all of these aluminium smelters pop up in Iceland because they have excess energy and they've used that as the ability to help introduce load to 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 that grid to operate the same thing. But the real critical part is you can't turn off an aluminium smelter or a steel mill on a whim. They've got molten steel that's going to harden in their, you know, in, mm. in their, in their um, production facility. So it's not good. It can't react on a dime. Bitcoin mining, it can be shut down within a number of seconds. We can go from really high, high load. And this is the, the really key thing is like even a, a web server, you're only going to have a finite amount of power that you're going to ever draw. Whereas Bitcoin mining, we can actually introduce more and more, as long as the uh, the connection capacity is there, we can have gigawatts worth of Bitcoin load sitting there at a geographical location that's suitable to the grid in containers. And then if you need that switched off in a hurry, you can switch it off in a hurry. And if longer term, it's no longer needed, we pick up those containers and we relocate them to the yeah. next energy center that's required. And it's really a mind blowing concept that is not fully understood by grid operators. And I think the reason why, like even in Australia, because I do this, for, that's my fiat job. Um, I, I can, you know, I, I work on this stuff from day to day and I've tried to enter into some conversations with the regulators, but, you know, the, the, the problem with most developed countries is the fact that because the energy uh, transmission grids, generation facilities took so much money to, to, to build out, it ended up being done by government because no one wanted to touch it. Because of this respect that you can't make money from it, like ultimately they're very, very expensive in their traditional sense to build out these grids. I've got a good example. So in Queensland, state of Queensland, in the northeast of Australia, we've got sixty-four thousand kilometres worth of what we call SWER network, which is poles and wires. So it's single wire earth return, single wires on poles going out to cattle stations, comm sites, all of this, returning through the mass of the earth is the return conductor. It's a pretty mind-blowing concept if you're not familiar with it. However, we've got 64,000 kilometres of this stuff that we've got to go out and service from day to day that services 4% of our customer base, only 4% of our customers. So we, it's not profitable. You can't do that in a profitable sense, and that's why governments have ended up owning a lot of the grid infrastructure over the years in most developed countries because it's taken a government to go and expend all of that to make sure that these people out in the bush have got power. So, you know, and that's that's a legacy thing that we've that we're going to carry forward. So but where where the point I'm trying to make is that the conversation when you've got a government utility owning your infrastructure, profit's not always the main driver. Whereas if you're mm. a, a private entity, profit's always the main driver. It's the it's the economic driver that make that forms most decisions is around profit. So that's I think where we see Texas, ERCOT is most of those generators and most of those um, facilities are private entities. So it's been an easy conversation for them because they're driven by profit. So it's a bit of a no brainer when you say we can um, we can um, continue on with. Uh, the, the building out of all of this all of this stuff and we can introduce this new economic actor this new revenue source to make all of that make sense so it's a bit of a no brainer for a private entity to go i think you're, so too you're yeah, telling me so i great. can have access so profit. simple yeah mm -hmm. where you you have that conversation with a government employee and they go well we've got all these other drivers the environment and social and you know all these other drivers profits neither here nor there really so it's it's a harder conversation to have and you couple that then with and this is why I'm a pretty, you know, dogmatic maxi with Bitcoin. And, and, I, and I do vocally talk out against all of this other grift, like NFTs and, um, you know, uh, all, all these crypto scams is because I'm, I'm passionate about the conversation about what Bitcoin enables humanity. And energy is one piece. You know, we've spoken about the money, all of these things. All of this other stuff is a distraction. And I've had these conversations with these government officials and they see Bitcoin in the same light as all these other scams. And it's not. It, it, it is really an uplift, an upgrade for humanity. And mm. all of this other stuff is a distraction. And, and, and in one respect, I'm grateful for the fact that this ETF, these ETFs have been approved in the United States. Because if anything, I think it puts uh, a bit of legitimacy in Bitcoin as being an asset 
that's worthy of a seat at the table for the discussion because now it's starting to be, you know, if BlackRock's investing in this and encouraging investment in this, maybe it's not embroiled in all of this other crypto and all of these other scams. So I think that conversation, like as a government entity, they can't be seen to be coupling with a scam, right? And that's where Bitcoin's been framed in the same light as all of these other scams. And we haven't had a, a, a really good, robust conversation because straight away, they can't see past the scam. So I think that's really where mm. the opportunity lies, particularly over this next cycle, is legitimacy in, a, it, in, in, in it as an asset and then also the legitimacy as it being a, a very viable future load to help monetize energy grids and help build out the energy grids of the future. Yeah. Well, you said extra pro profitability for commercial companies, right? But I, I would say that's a secondary effect. The first effect is just 100% ROI just on your basis uh, investment of just the... Um, Correct. The, the how to say the equipment basically yep. to for you know for these sources so um and, and well fascinating that a government uh, employee or government uh, uh, how do you say company energy company then says to you well we're not thinking about that but uh, yes not profitability but you could say well if you are a hundred percent efficient you know how does that sound you know but but then uh, I think we come back to what are the incentives of a government and the broken money and all these things like that. E even that is, in most big organizations, not even top of mind, right? Because they, they are not focused on money in that sense. And there is always money as a government always money. Uh, can just print uh, agency, it, right? <laughs> right? So there is always money. So you don't have that incentive to think about, am I actually using the money in the most optimal way? Um, possible so even when you come with a solution they are not even aware of the problem right to, yeah. to what you bring this solution to so um and i think yeah, that's really where be hard. the education yeah. opportunity exists for to to reach out to consumers right is is like your energy bills everyone's energy bills are increasing and they're going at an exponential rate so if you understand bitcoin also understand energy and then start having those conversations with the members of parliament to say I demand this. Like this is, you know, if it's a government infrastructure, it's really belongs to the people. Therefore, I demand that you at least investigate this this notion of being able to introduce a new revenue source that's going to obviously secure the network, do all these excess extra things, extra benefits. Excuse me a second. I had a phone call coming through. Um, all of these extra benefits, and I, as a constituent of your of your government demand that you at least look into this because it's going to mean I'm, I'm going to have cheaper or more more approachable um, energy bills into the future. And I guess like in particular, if if where this is really important is if renewables actually resonates with you, understand like this is a millennials podcast. So I think millennials in general are a bit more um, accepting of, of this idea around achieving 100% renewables, right? It's, it's critical. You cannot have an energy grid, a safe, reliable energy grid based on renewables if you don't have Bitcoin mining at least playing a part in that energy mix. And, and exactly. I can explain why yes. that is a little bit around, um, again, it ties back into this notion around maximum demand, right? But if we look at maximum demand from a renewables perspective, wind energy, we talk about this thing in, in the energy space called capacity factor. So that is what is your installed capacity and how much of that are we likely to be able to tap into on average, um, mm. you know, reliably into the future. So wind energies um, are around 30% efficient at best. Okay. So that means if your maximum demand's here, you need at least three times the size of your maximum demand in installed wow. capacity in order yeah. to be able to maintain a safe, reliable grid. Now that's a, that's a, it's a, um, it's pro there's a lot more nuance in that, right? And I'm not saying that even th the notion of Bitcoin being the panacea to soak up all that extra two thirds, but, but there's going to be. If we talk about fair value for the energy, that already three axes the price, the fair value of the correct energy in a sense, right? If, if you do nothing, exactly. So mm. I mean, and and this is where the framing sometimes I think we get it wrong in in Bi the Bitcoin space about it being the panacea to fix everything. It it won't be the panacea. It won't soak up all excess two thirds, and that's not what we're suggesting. But it definitely will play a part in that energy mix to be able to make that sustainable. So the types of things to make a hundred percent renewable grid 
that pe- that they're looking at. Um, you know, in Australia, nuclear is not really considered. Nuclear is, in my mind, a good option to making sure that you've got rotating machines. It's got a lot of benefits for the stability of a grid. But if we ignore nuclear for a second, what they're looking at in that energy mix is solar, wind, battery storage, hydro, pumped hydro. Um, and then we're also looking at different things like hydrogen production. That's another good way. But hydrogen production is also very inefficient. That's only about 30%. You'll expend three times as much energy as you will be able to store with current technology. It doesn't mean that that won't improve over time, but this is the, the type of energy mix that we need to start considering in and around introducing extra revenue into that grid to be able to monetize and get your ROI on those capital projects to make everything else viable. So you can invest in battery storage, so you can invest in hydro yeah, exactly. and pumped hydro yeah. and all of those sort of things over time and, and build out a reliable grid because nobody wants rolling blackouts. Like that's that's not where we want to go. That's and, a failure, yeah. 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 And I think like it's it's a it's a tragedy that some like and, and particularly those in the younger generation are actually saying, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with rolling blackouts because I've got to do my bit. You know, it's this it's this real socialist type of mentality mm. towards towards the future, um, which it, it's. Uh, I mean, that might be that might be um, admirable in in some circles, but it's not needed. Like that that's the if if we if we don't have to have rolling blackouts, you don't have to make the sacrifice, and we can have all of the benefits of a nice, reliable, safe grid, while also making sure that it's it's profitable for the companies to run, and your energy costs are as small as they can be. It's a bit of a no-brainer in my mind. Uh, I think it's because in some way the line of communication has been energy usage is bad. But as I think as we talked about before, the, the entire world, world revolves around energy, right? I, I mean, like if you look around, if I see you here, a plant, a book, a candle glass in my in my window everything costs energy to create or maintain right so the 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 fact that we now think oh energy usage is bad no energy we need more use of energy that's how we propel our civilization forward right but the fact that people um really think this right I think it goes back a bit to the mental model that we talked about before when when you know there's people who really think this Oh yeah, I'm okay with rolling blackouts. Then again, you're deferring your own responsibility to someone else who is not able to figure it out, right? They are not able to figure out how to make, you know, these um renewable sources economically viable to actually use and give us more energy so we can actually go go forward, right? So you're again letting yourself be defeated by the I don't want to say incompetence, right? But by the actions of other people. But it's also because we just don't know, right? It's only by studying and, and uh, yeah, it's just studying. It's just spending time. And most people don't have the time to study money. That's what we talked about, right? But this is a whole other subject, basically. And I think that is also the problem in a sense that it's so easy to just basically lay down and, you know, follow what other yeah. people are saying right it's just it's hard to think for yourself if you cannot even get to the level of knowledge or understanding to think for yourself to create your own opinion or view on something then of course you follow other people and, and it's really like it's about freedom of choice as well and i think it's it's setting a really bad precedent because i mean you might agree with that you might say i'm okay with rolling blackouts but you're then forcing your decision on everybody else because you can't just back opt in time out for if, yourself if, if yes also but we're also going back in time yeah back in a sense case. right we're going <laughs> back to the 1900s or 1800s or whatever and i i talked about this in in previous episodes it's it's also a uh, downstream from the money as you mentioned before right like uh i like to say like currently uh, this is part of my pitch right but why is it funny that the bread was 20 cents 50 years ago and now it's four or five dollars or euros whatever your currency is right like that is going back in time things should become cheaper energy is abundant right and if you're going to be okay with rolling blackouts then welcome to the 1800s right it's it's so illogical 
uh, yeah, I, I, this is something I really want to fight personally, right? Because it's just, yeah, you're convinced of something that is not real and very, uh, yeah, it's nonsensical. It doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense to agree uh, to that just because, yeah, other people are incompetent or the money is corrupted, basically, right? Like Couldn't the, agree more. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. I love how our conversation went to really different directions. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's what I love about Bitcoin. That's what I love about talking <laughs> to other Bitcoiners. These are, I think, two of the big dimensions of Bitcoin for people to, again, I think, study and eventually like try to under understand uh, i think one also doesn't exist without the other and vice versa right like you you have to understand these things so and, and there's, so there's much a whole for, host yeah. of downstream effects like like you said it all just comes back to to money ultimately and all of the downstream effects of money and if we fix money and we can fix energy and we can fix real estate and we can fix all of these things because everything is is correlated everything's yeah. you know connected so you know it and that's why i'm here man that's why you know that's why i love I love Bitcoin from that respect that it, it, it ultimately, if you, you can still, you can peel back all of these layers and you can find really sound arguments to like, it's again, it's a cliche mm -hmm. and it's overused. Bitcoin fixes this, but it really, really does. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, I think a fix, you know, fix the money, fix the world sounds very grandiose, right? But yeah. I think for people, especially also millennials, right? People who are concerned about the future, people who have young families, right? Like, of, like I'm the same, right? But uh, I, I think I tweeted this yesterday, but think about everything you would want to fix in the world, whatever it is. It is uh, in that state because the money is broken. Every ev every bad thing in the world is downstream from the money. The money, broken money, you know, creates perverse incentives, and people will abuse that, right? And that's why we have to fix the money, money that is. That, that we cannot tamper with, right? And I mentioned the corruptibility of, of the humans before, but I think this is money that fixes our own corruptibility because we cannot fuck with it. And that is the entire point. We need money that we cannot corrupt or any other person can corrupt, and that's the trustlessness, right? So if we have that technology to exchange value between each other that is incorruptible, then we we can try to be corrupt as humans we can try to scam or abuse you know whatever the bitcoin money system is that we use but you won't get really far and the same goes for governments right i think what you said like if you eventually start demanding and you can do that as citizens i think you can demand your things because you can demand what will be good for you because the government is also just other people right and they have the same issues with, you know, their personal internal challenges, whatever, their family, and all, all these things. Like, um, I think it's Steve Jobs says, like, uh, everything you see has built, was, was made up by people no, not smarter than you, right? I think that's, that's really true. So if we have an incorruptible way of exchanging value, then everyone needs to basically get in line, including the government, right? And then if they want to ask you for money to subsidize their bad investments in renewable energy sources and we have bitcoin we can say you know well convince me pitch me <laughs> you know like just not take it from me and not and and then use it in in the you know um an ineffective way so yeah i mean i love this conversation i think this is uh, really what it's about so I want to thank you already so much, but I do have a last question that I want to ask and I Absolutely. ask everyone the same same question. And the question is, what is a core belief you will never let go? I, my core belief I'll never let go is I think this notion behind, you know, and, and this isn't necessarily Bitcoin related, um, but this this notion of you're, you're in charge of your own destiny. So don't, Please don't sit on the sidelines thinking that you don't have optionality and you don't you can't do anything in in your present circumstance. Um, Bitcoiners, I think, get Bitcoin really quick because we most of us are self motivated people. We read, we take the um, the opportunity to improve ourselves, to to learn, to to never stop learning. And I think that's a core belief of mine that will never stop 
changing is like, you know, I, I talk about this optionality of Bitcoin and around it giving me optionality. And that may mean that I might be able to leave my fiat job one day and pursue the things that I'm passionate about. It doesn't mean I'm going to stop. I'll never retire. I will never stop. I'm one of those, um, you know, motivatedly minded people to keep the hustle going but it'll just mean that i can choose where i direct that time and i think if if there's a core belief that um that i i I hold really true that i can never see changing is that people need to upgrade themselves they need to never stop learning they need to always be looking inwards reflection how can i be better how can i keep learning and what can i do in order to change um what's in my sphere of influence if i don't like my world take action if I don't like my situation, my job, my, you know, the way that, um, you know, you, you're interacting with family and friends, own it, own it, look in, look inward and see what can I do to affect change because it's in with your, within your power, within your ability to learn about what you need to do to make the change. Amazing ending. Love that. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for your time. Rama, and, absolutely uh, love that, man. Appreciate your time. Me too, man. Well, I hope to see you again in real life. I don't know when or where, but uh, let's uh, let's see. I'll link to your uh, X account, Looking Glass, the book, so people can follow you and check out your stuff. And uh, yeah, thanks again, man. And uh, appreciate it. Thanks. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review, and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening.